in 2015, the intention of firemen were called to a fire in a house in Ropaswell, a community with about 5,000 inhabitants in Switzerland. Disturbing discoveries would be located at the site, and soon it became clear that something horrific had been done before the fire broke out. The crime committed would come to be known as the most horrific murder in Switzerland's modern history, and the perpetrator of this crime would come to be known as the Beast of Ropaswell, not necessarily due to his looks or physique, but due to the nature of the crime and the motive behind it. But before I do get into this story, if you're a lover of disturbing, dark and mysteriously spooky true life stories, you might consider subscribing, turn on all post notifications and like the video if you find it interesting. And with that said, let's get straight into this story. Ropperswil is a small municipality in the district of Lenzburg in the canton of Argau in Switzerland. It is a town 19 miles west of Zurich. As of December 2020, it had a population just short of 6,000 people. A population of which majority of the people are either Roman Catholics, belong to the Swiss Reformed Church or to the Christian Catholic faith. Most of the people from Ropperswil speak German as their main language and with Italian being the second most common language spoken. Living in the northern Swiss town of Ropperswil in 2015 was the Shawas family. Kala Shawafrey Bagaus was a married woman born on the 10th of June 1967. The 48 year old mother had two sons. The oldest son by the name of Dion Shawa who was born on the 11th of April 1996. The youngest son was Devin Shawa, who was born on the 15th of August 2002 and was six years younger than Dion. Dion was 19 years old, while Davin was 13 years old. I couldn't find any more background information about this family, but from the information I had gathered about them, they were much like any other peaceful, loving family who genuinely loved each other and always loved to spend quality time together. On December 21st, 2015, which was around the Christmas period, a man rang on the door of the Shawas family home after the man of the home had left for work. The man would tell the mother of the home that he was the son's school psychologist and needed to speak with her about her youngest son bullying behavior. The man would present a business card and identified himself as Mr. Sebastian Meyer, making the woman think he was really on an official visit. The mother, Carla, would let this man into her home and would offer him a coffee, thinking that the man had a genuine interest to help her family, particularly her youngest son. However, that wasn't the man's motive. It would turn out that the man had seen a 13 years old Davin a few times walking by around the area, and strange thoughts had come into his mind. These thoughts became plans, and when he was let inside the home of that little boy, Davin, it became an opportunity to carry out his sinister and devilish plan. Moments later, after he was inside the home, this man would take out a knife from a bag he was carrying and would begin to threaten the family. He would then force the mother, Kala, to bind and gag the rest of the family, which included a 13-year-old Davin, a 19-year-old Dion, and a 21-year-old Simona Fass, who was Dion's girlfriend. The man would then order the mother Kala to drive to two local ATMs where she would draw about 10,000 Swiss franc and in another ATM where she would draw about 1,000 euros, threatening to kill the family if she alerts anyone or the authorities while she was out withdrawing the money. Kala would do as she had been told, thinking that after the money had been given to this man, that she and the rest of her loved ones would be let go. However, that was not the case. After they had returned, she would also be tied and gagged by this man. When he was done tying the mother up, he would then begin to force himself upon the youngest son, a 13-year-old Davin. Reportedly, he continuously did this for six different times while the family watched in horror. 
when he was satisfied with this twisted crime he had just committed, he would one after the other begin to slit their throats, killing each of the four persons. After killing them and making sure they were dead, he then started working on covering his tracks. This he did by setting the house on fire. After that was done, he then left the house. When he was out of the house and out of sight from the rest of the locals living within the area, the man would eventually hide the knife in a gift seal packaging and then threw it away in an unknown and undisclosed garbage bin. Few minutes later, the fire set by this man, who now could be seen not just as a thief, but also a pedophile, began to burn and race through the home of the Shawas family. Neighbors would call the firefighters for an emergency, and when the firefighters arrived, they started to quench the fire, and on entering the home, they saw the severely burnt and blackened remains of Kala, Simona Fass, Dion, and Davin. They thought they had died from the fire. But when they saw the gruesome cuts on the victim's throats, they knew this was something darker and they would contact the police authorities. The area was now considered to be a crime scene. The father would be contacted to inform him of what had happened to his family. Presumably, he had gone out to work that day and had left his family, thinking it would be a normal day. The police would seal off the area and an intensive investigation would begin to search for and arrest the person who had committed such a sadistic crime. While within the crime scene, the police would find the fingerprints and DNA of the suspect. They would also begin to interview the locals living within the town of Rapaswal as fear enveloped the people who were now aware that the killer is still working freely amongst them and had not been caught. Over the following days, after a murder that shocked Switzerland, the police would interview over 100 people in the town. They also examined DNA evidence and in a massive manhunt would offer the highest ever reward that has been made in the history of Switzerland in order to cash a perpetrator. An amount of 100,000 Swiss francs was the reward money offered in exchange for information that would lead to the arrest of the suspect or perpetrators. However, after all the efforts, it was to no avail. But that would change in May 2016. Meanwhile, the Swiss press would dub the suspect as the Beast of Ropa's World. And after 146 days of the Shawas family murder, there would be a break in the case. Due to the lots of effort put in by the Switzerland authorities before they finally got the suspect, the exact details of how the authorities eventually pinpointed the suspect was not fully released, probably not to prevent future criminals from leaving their mark on the internet before a crime. However, I do feel like the intelligence and effort that went into catching this murderer was too smart and impressive. And I was able to dig in and find out some of the crucial steps that were implemented. But before that, we would have to go back to about five months ago when police first collected fingerprints and DNA evidence at the crime scene. During the initial investigation, the investigators couldn't match this evidence from the crime scene to anyone in particular, as the person who had committed this crime has never been convicted of any crime previously and the police could not tie the victims to anyone close to them or who might have intended to cause them harm. So the fingerprints and DNA evidence were kept while alternative methods were being brainstormed on. So to narrow down their search, the authorities did an antenna search, an expensive search which was previously considered an important piece of the puzzle in the investigation of the Ropa Sewell murders. This method was used to determine which mobile phones were connected to the transmitter mast near the crime scene at the time of the crime. Although the killer's number actually showed up, it remained a single one in a mountain of data which comprises of about 30,000 phone numbers. The authorities knew that this method would be close to impossible 
in figuring out who the killer was with such massive amount of phone numbers if they were to depend solely on that. Then, they implemented three other important steps that finally led to the arrest of the beast of Ropa's wheel. The first important clue came from the internet giant, Google. Investigators had used Google to obtain the IP addresses of all the computers from which the victim's family had Googled during the period before the crime. According to investigators, it was only thanks to the help of the American search engine that they got on the right track. The beast of Ropa's wheel had searched for his victims before he committed the crime and found information on the internet about the family of the 13-year-old boy he had been stalking. This was a clear data trail. When Google released this information, the investigators' work focused mainly on the group of people who had searched for the family on the internet. Google itself did not comment on the individual case, but writes that there were five requests from Switzerland within six months which had searched the family, but which matters were not communicated so as not to disrupt the investigation. For the second step, only from here did the antenna search come into play in this crucial step, and that was an extra burden for the beast of Ropa's wheel. A man who would always take a walk with his dog, as the movement pattern of using the dog was common. Authorities would begin to throw the man closely, and observe that one of their suspects usually walked with his dogs at about the same time and often passed the shower family home. However, his cell phone did not connect to the regular transmitter mast. The investigators would continue their underground investigation only to observe that on that Monday morning the crime was committed. The monster of Ropa's wheel had not gone for a walk with his dogs as usual. The killer would later state during his trial that he had put his mobile phone in flight mode before the crime was committed. When investigators noticed that their suspects had changed movement pattern during the course of the investigation, this made him even more suspicious and hence he became the next important piece of the puzzle. At this point, investigators now had a suspect, but no hard evidence. So they decided to set a trap for their suspect who had changed his movement. It was this third and final step that solved the case of a twisted quadruple murder. According to the police source, they continued following their suspect and knew that he was on his way to Arau, which is a town in Switzerland and the capital of the northern Swiss canton of Argau. Along the road leading to this town, a traffic control was set up between Ropasuel and the town of Roar in Arkau. During one of these traffic stops, the suspect was stopped, given an alcohol test and made to blow into the tube. This was how the investigators got the suspect's DNA in the form of his saliva. He was then allowed to continue with his journey and this piece of DNA was immediately sent to the laboratory that day where it was compared with the DNA found at the crime scene, which was kept by the officers as there was no other sample to match it with during the earlier stages of the crime. And this final step was a direct hit. The result turned out to be a positive match and the suspect was finally confirmed. The next morning, which was in May 2016, about 10 police officers stormed the Starbucks branch in Arau and arrested the killer just before 9 a.m exactly 146 days after the murders. Disturbingly, the man had already researched the internet again and had new potential victims in sight. The beast of Ropa's wheel would be identified as a 33 years old man by the name of Thomas Nick. Thomas was an unmarried local resident in Ropa's wheel with no previous convictions or connections to the Shawas family. He lived with his mother and his two dogs just a few hundred meters away from where he had committed the horrific murder. He was also a long-time local youth soccer coach. A spokesman for the soccer club where he had been a coach on hearing what Thomas had done would say that nobody in the club would have thought Thomas Nick would be capable of this. He was always decent, another man would say. A Ropa's will mayor would say they were relieved now the arrest had been made. But there was also a certain amount of shame and dismay that it was really a member of the village community that had committed such a crime. After his arrest, Thomas would make an immediate comprehensive confession which detailed how and why it happened. On that Monday morning of December 21st, 2015, 
a 33 years old Thomas had waited for Carla's partner to leave home that morning before meticulously putting his plans into action. And based on his confession, the investigators came to know that he had acted alone. And did we also come to know of how this gruesome crime which shocked Switzerland came to be? A crime which was so sinister that the media had to dub him as the beast of Ropa's will, as there was no link between him and the Shawas family or any of his potential victims which he had searched up on on the internet. The motive of his actions was merely due to both financial and sexual reasons. An investigator would later say that his arrest may have prevented further killings. This was not only due to the internet search of his victims, which he would later stalk. But secondly, investigators would also search his home after his arrest, and further investigations and questioning would reveal that he had concrete plans to continue to commit similar crimes. The police had found a knife, pistol, cable ties, and adhesive tape and handcuffs made from ropes in a backpack, including an electric lighter, gloves, mouth mask, and sex toys suggesting that he may have been planning further attacks to other families in other towns. It would be determined that he had been spying on two other families in the town of Bern and in Zeloton, located in North Switzerland. Shared pornography, which included more than a thousand videos and over 10,000 photos, was also found on computers at his home and which was seized by the Swiss police in Ropaswell. Investigators also found the names of 11 boys aged between 11 and 14 years old written inside his notebook hence one aspect of this case which concerned and disturbed parents when this was revealed was that he was a football coach for a junior team in the area where they lived and where he still worked for the club till he was arrested a fact which led parents to fear he may have abused young players at the club especially after hearing what he had done to a 13 years old davin shower in their family home and what was found on his home computer. But the police would tell the media that there was no evidence that the man had sexually abused anyone at the football club or elsewhere, except for the one which he already admitted that he did. Allegedly, during his confession, Thomas would reveal how after the murder, he had gone home and then took his mother and dogs for a walk and later met with colleagues at a restaurant and casino in Zurich. A commander of the Ropas Wheel Fire Service that attended the scene of the crime when the home was set on fire would say that one of their biggest fears after the murder had been that the murderer would strike again. According to him, for many of them, the last half year was a very emotional time and they now felt great relief that he had finally been caught. After all this series of relief and talks following the arrest of the dubbed Beast of Ropas Wheel, the public prosecutor would order a psychiatric evaluation of the murderer who would have supposedly become a pedophile serial killer in Switzerland. However, he was found to be mentally stable, hence was not able to plead insanity due to his crimes. On March 16, 2018, which was two years and three months after the crime, and a year and ten months after his arrest, Thomas Nick would plead guilty. And in his words, he would say, I'm a pedophile. While in court, the lead judge, when reading the verdict, would say that the accused, who had no prior criminal record, took the motorway of horror. The man acted in cold blood, in a primitive manner, without pity nor empathy. The prosecution also alleged that the 34 years old Thomas, who was reportedly a student, and the youth football coach who lived with his mother had meticulously planned his crime. According to the court's president, he showed no empathy and was extremely egoistic. The danger of a repeat offense is high. He committed a textbook crime and acted in an utterly ruthless manner. What he did was simply grotesque. He was fully aware of his actions and it was a deliberate act, he added. It would also be revealed that several months before the crime, he had purchased his weapon, a large kitchen knife which was used for the murder and which has never been found. He had also made several trips to the neighborhood where the family lived. Another Swiss legal expert and judge would say that this case was among the worst 
in Swiss criminal history and that she had seen nothing like it in her long career. The district court of Lenzburg in the canton of Argau then announced the verdict. Thomas Nick was found guilty of several murders, extortion, deprivation of liberty, hostage taking, sexual assault, sexual acts with a child, child pornography, including arson among other counts. He was sentenced to indefinite incarceration in line with Article 64 of the Swiss Criminal Code which meant that he will, in theory, only be eligible for parole if strict conditions were met. Simply put, the court reportedly left open the possibility of parole after 20 years. Meanwhile, many members of the public had hoped he had been sentenced to life incarceration, which is a punishment reserved for extremely dangerous offenders who are considered to be untreatable via therapy in Switzerland. Also, under this punishment, parole would less likely happen, only taking place if new scientific findings allowed for successful treatments, or on the grounds that old age or sickness meant that an accused no longer posed a risk. However, a legal expert would say that the responsibility of the court was to ignore public opinion and treat the case objectively. According to her, revenge can play no role in the judgment of a crime. And since Thomas was a first-time offender, that it was highly unlikely he would be given a lifelong sentence. However, the public prosecutor by the name of Barbara Lopasha would give her support on the verdict, saying that the goal of the prosecutor's office was to obtain a lifelong or indeterminate sentence and which had been achieved by the office, and that the accused is definitely going to spend a long time in prison where he is. And according to her, she would say, and I quote, I think that is good and that is right. As for me, I think I have to agree with her, although I still feel he deserved worse for ending four lives in a gruesome manner. However, I shall refrain from giving my own opinion and would like to hear what you think about this case. During the earlier stages of the investigation, the police apparently received 250 tips from the public. As for the 100,000 Swiss franc reward money, the reward was later given to more than 40 police investigators who worked on the case and helped catch this murderer. As for Thomas Nick, he would later say he hopes to return to society one day. As for me, I hope that never happens. As usual, before I end this story, I would like to say that our love and respect goes to the Shawas family. They never deserved such a gruesome ending in the hands of a psychopathic pedophile. Their story and lives should be remembered and celebrated, and they solely remain the focus in this case.